Uh, very, very grateful to be here. I do have to make one correction. Uh, my son's name is Josiah, uh, not, not Joshua. I would have heard about that if I hadn't said something. Since we're on the topic of my wife and children, let me just say what an absolute uh, fun, uh, thrilling, great, uh, so proud, how much joy uh, Beth and the boys uh, give me. I don't think we hear it enough. I'm so excited to be married and so excited to have kids, and they really have been nothing but a joy. Uh, so this morning, you know, I heard from many of you over the last weeks, we were supposed to do this two weeks ago before uh, the hurricane, and it was canceled, and I heard from many of you that, uh, you know, you were very excited to hear me preach uh, and uh, I was thankful for that, and yet I corrected each one of you and said, no, I'm not preaching, this is a lecture. Uh, so that simply means I don't have to worry so much about stories and illustrations, but I trust that this will be inspiring to you and will hold your attention. Well, this morning, we're going to look at uh, a very early example of exegesis. Very early. You know, we talk a lot about exegesis and exposition here. Well, this morning we're going to hear something from the Bible itself as a sort of exegesis. Now, to do that in any kind of convincing manner, we need to consider carefully our understanding of biblical authorship. You know, we, we often kind of come in uh, to seminary. I know this was the case with me. I came into seminary with a particular conception of how these authors wrote down their texts. I didn't even know I had it, but of course I came in with it. And one of the things that has happened as I've studied the Old Testament is that kind of simplistic view of authorship has sort of been blown, so to speak. So one of my tasks here this morning is to try to use the Old Testament to help us with an appropriate, uh, a, that is a text appropriate uh, conception, if you will, of biblical authorship. Well, this morning we're going to be in Deuteronomy 33, and primarily we're going to look at Deuteronomy 33, 21. So I've, I've put a few versions up on the screen, and we'll just probably pick one of them and then kind of summarize the rest. But the first one just happens to be the CSB. He chose the best part for himself because a ruler's portion was assigned there for him. He came with the leaders of the people. He carried out the Lord's justice and his ordinances for Israel. Now we can just move down to the next one. It looks like the ESV. He chose the best of the land for himself. For there a commander's portion was reserved. And he came with the heads of the people, so on and so forth. Uh, the next one is the JPS. He chose a first part for himself. For there a portion of a ruler was reserved, and so on and so forth. The last is the NS NIV. He chose the best land for himself. The leader's portion was kept for him. You'll notice maybe some uh, differences there, some minor convergences, and, and it's interesting behind those converges, uh, convergences lay questions, which is the reason why they're not all translated maybe exactly the same anyway. Well, later we'll consider our own translation uh, of this verse as we get going. Now, Deuteronomy 33 is considered the blessing of Moses. The chapter contains some of the most difficult passages in the entire Old Testament. Deuteronomy 33, 2 is actually uh, one of them. Very, very difficult. We won't go into that this morning. Uh, there are actually others in the chapter, but we're going to look. We're going to be looking at Deuteronomy 33, 21. Now, the classic article that has been written down throughout the last two or three hundred years is by two well-known uh, Old Testament scholars, Frank Cross and David Noel Freeman. In a 1940 art 1948 article, they say this, quote, the introduction has suffered badly in the process of transmission, since another part of it has apparently found its way into 21b. That's our verse, of course. The phrase, quote, hidden, and he came with the heads of the people, unquote, is doubtless to be revised on the base of the Septuagint to read, Quote, and the heads of the people gathered together. These words are wholly out of context in the blessing of Gad, verse 20, and must inevitably be connected with the almost identical phrase in verse 5. The next by colon, the righteousness of the Lord he does and his judgments are with Israel, also seems to belong to the introduction. But the exact order of the parts cannot be determined. It is not possible to reconstruct these verses with any degree of confidence. While a number of colas seem clear in themselves, there is no way to organize them into a coherent unity. 
without a drastic reworking of the Masoretic text. The Masoretic text is just our Hebrew Bible. Now, these uh, two scholars are not the only ones who have had trouble with Deuteronomy 33, 21. I've also uh, chosen a conservative uh, commentator here from the uh, Word Biblical Commentary Series, a conservative commentary series out of Dallas. Uh, Dwayne Christensen writes in 2002 about this same passage, quote, this reading is an apostrophe. He's talking about verse 21. That is closely related to verses 4 and 5 in the proem of the testamentary blessing of Moses. The focus of attention in verse 21 is Moses. Yahweh is the subject of the verbs. The action is that of Yahweh appointing Moses as leader in Israel and awarding him the victor's share. Moses, in turn, executes the judgments of Yahweh within and on behalf of of the people. Well, we see here a little bit of a challenge that's in this particular verse, Deuteronomy 33, 21. So they provide a context for the thesis of the lecture, and here's kind of what I'm trying to do in the lecture. The latest developments in Old Testament studies, that would be my field, and studies of the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's a related field, um, we'll get into that in a moment. These two areas converge at a point that will also help us understand Deuteronomy 33, and in particular, verse 21, and its relationship to verses 20 and 22, and as a matter of fact, to the, all of chapter 20, uh, 33, and as a matter of fact, to the whole message of the Pentateuch, something that we should be very, very interested in. Well, Old Testament studies then. Now, one of the things that you'll be glad to know was my first run-through of this lecture uh, two weeks ago, uh, two weeks ago yesterday or Tuesday, was an hour and 40 minutes. So I wondered about the sovereignty of God in the hurricane, but uh, it did it wind up better uh, for you all. So I just will be summarizing the uh, part about Old Testament studies subsequent to the Enlightenment, and then we'll pick up Old Testament studies within the last 20 or 30 years. So before I get to that, though, as we think about Old Testament studies, this is where I want to challenge or I want us to think about our understanding of biblical authorship. What is your view of biblical authorship? How were these texts created? How did the authors make meaning? I ask this a lot in my class, and a lot of students come in uh, with, again, just a, uh, their conception of authorship of uh, perhaps just a, a writer just kind of witnessing everything and kind of writing down what he is seeing. Or maybe he's like a secretary just kind of recording dictation of his boss. Is that our view of biblical authorship? So let me ask a few questions. How did the author of Kings, for example, write his book? Or should I say scroll, since books had not been invented at that point? How did the prophet Amos, or the author of Jeremiah, or the author of the Psalter, write their text? Was Amos on the hillside calling Israel to repentance, and on the one hand calling, and on the other hand jotting down his prophecies for future generations? How did his prophecies coalesce into a text or scroll? How did Moses come to a knowledge of what Abraham was thinking in Genesis 17? How did the cycle of stories in the book of Judges uh, amalgamate this kind of, how did they come together in this book that we now call Judges, which, by the way, was authored uh, from its own, from the words in the text, was authored over a period of over 318 years at least. That's the that's a number that's mentioned, uh, and obviously not by an eyewitness. How was this authored? Where did they obtain the stories? How did the Psalms of David, Moses, Asaph become gathered into a single scroll? Or the 12 minor prophets? Well, here's a lot of questions on prophecy, again, just to begin to get us thinking about how the authors made meaning. Well, studies in the Old Testament began to ask these types of questions after the Enlightenment, subsequent to the Reformation within this milieu of scientific and historical interest. Scholars at this point began to recognize the complexity in these texts as well as the unique world from which these texts came. You know, we often, uh, again, think about our own world and uh, imagine if you stopped to look at all of the texts coming at you 
You've got text on the screens. You've got text in front of you. You've got signs on doors. I mean, text just everywhere. Imagine a world where there are no texts. That's more akin to the biblical world, the, uh, the world in which these authors wrote. Prior to word processors and typewriters, prior even to pen and, pa- uh, pen and paper, for the most part. You might recall what was Josh was supposed to write his copy of the scroll on. Right? He was supposed to paint it on a rock. So again, the, this world that these texts come from end up uh, influencing our hermeneutics and our understanding. So uh, studies began to ask these, Old Testament studies began to ask these questions. And they developed this thing called source criticism, and it went to form criticism, traditions criticism. This is one of the things I wanted to explain to you. Redaction criticism. Redaction criticism, of course, just traces similar linguistic expressions through a text. We can think of several examples of that. We actually then come to canon criticism, where scholars traced, for theological concerns really, scholars traced similar linguistic expressions to a unifying framework within a book or part of the canon. Uh, Scholars also began to use these kind of similar linguistic expressions or footprints to understand the selection, arrangement, adaptation, and writing of text in order to create a larger whole in a structured and meaningful way. This is composition criticism, one of the things that I tried to do here at Southeastern uh, quite a bit. We might think of the Book of Kings in this, if you think about the book of Kings, of course, the author of Kings refers to his sources over 30 times as he writes his book, right? He keeps, after the first 13 chapters where he talks about the failure of Solomon, he, you know, and he gets that from the annals of, the, of Solomon, he then moves to the annals of the kings of the north and the annals of the kings of the south, and then he goes back and forth between the north and south, north and south, north and south, and then he actually... Uh, puts in the stories about Elijah and Elisha, and then he goes back to the kings of the north, kings of the south, kings of the north, kings of the south, until the north actually is obliterated from the face of the earth when they were destroyed in, in 721, 722, and then he just, then he deals with the rest of the kings of the south until Jerusalem itself, that is the southern kingdom, is also destroyed in 586. So we see this kind of concern uh, of the whole, and yet he's obviously using different uh, texts. Well, really, this takes us uh, right down to the recent period uh, towards the end of the 20th century. But there's one more kind of movement that has taken place within the last uh, 30, 40 years that I want to talk about, and that is the movement that has converged with these analyses of the Dead Sea Scrolls, these, this discovery we'll talk about here in a second. So scholars have kind of called this sort of activity that we begin to see or we begin to see in the Old Testament and also what we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls, inner biblical exegesis or some sort of uh, exegetical production or exegetical uh, techniques. So how about the discoveries of the Dead Sea? What are these? Well, the discoveries of the manuscripts from the Dead Sea have been called one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century. These things are amazing. The discoveries consist of fragments of approximately 1,000 manuscripts in caves near Qumran. Most of them are manuscripts either of the Bible or pertaining to interpretation of the Bible, and they date from about 250 CE Uh, I'm sorry, 250 BCE to 50 CE. So on the one hand, the biblical manuscripts among the fragments, representing about 200 manuscripts, signal the great importance of what we call the Old Testament to the various Jewish communities in that era. Imagine uh, a thousand manuscripts, mostly concerning the Old Testament, from the period of 200 BC, about the time of Jesus. Moreover, the manuscripts there witnessed the remarkable accuracy of the Masoretic scribes who copied the manuscripts of the Bible and were active from approximately 500 to 1500 CE. And these are the ones who are responsible for the foundation of our modern Hebrew Bible. So we can show a timeline, if you will, of uh, just where these Dead Sea Scrolls fit in. There we go. So if you can see that. 
we have here, I think I have here on the screen, um, it looks like uh, 586 over here of the destruction of Jerusalem. Then you have 539, this edict of Cyrus. Hopefully you guys already know this from your Old Testament class. And here in the middle, you'll notice kind of sandwiched in the middle over on the right, we have Jesus and the apostles. And then 500, 1500 is really where the foundation of our modern Hebrew Bible comes from. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew Bible that I'm holding up here is from a copy of a text from 1008. And this is the oldest, prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, this was the oldest Hebrew copy of the Hebrew Bible that we had. So 1,000 years after the time of Christ, we had this manuscript, the manuscript, which of course, which underlies this text right here. And that was the oldest one we had until the discovery of these Dead Sea Scrolls. So these Dead Sea Scrolls are wonderful and awesome. They, uh, again, witness the accuracy of our Bible, a tremendous witness. Now, the discoveries of the Dead Sea have also forced a reappraisal of aspects of Old Testament studies itself. Studies such as text criticism uh, are going through quite a period of upheaval and uh, transition because we now have texts from that era and we know that the, uh, some people were literally making books in this era. Moreover, we have this kind of a reappraisal of the production of texts, scrolls, and so-called books. All of these things have uh, seen new proposals. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls provide a sort of missing link, so to speak, between the world in which the Old Testament books were pr produced, again, 539 in this era, 586, and so on and so forth, and then the centuries leading up to uh, the centuries leading up to the millennium, the time of Christ, and then again, the late medieval period, which is where our foundation for our modern Bible comes from. Now, I, I have this practice in my class. I can see that I already need to start implementing this practice. Whenever I see people nodding off, I just do that. Can you, can you hear that? I see a couple of people nodding off, so that is uh, to get your attention. Now, uh, scholars, as scholars increasingly... All right, all right, I saw Hildreth here nodding off for a second, so... As scholars increasingly recognize the complexity of growth in the Hebrew Bible, analyses of the Dead Sea Scrolls and their publication after finding them in 1950, approximately 1950, uh, they also began exhibiting a similar type of growth, right? And we could call this growth textual production. That's what I always often call it, this kind of textual growth, textual production. Interbiblical exegesis is kind of one of the techniques that this has done. There are two types of textual production I want to show you this morning uh, among the hosts that were there. Uh, the first is called rewriting of the biblical text. I think I have a screen there for us, the rewriting of the biblical text. Rewritten scripture, it's called. It's received a great deal of comment, comment at Qumran. And the main tra trait of this genre consists of a rewriting, that is a copying of a biblical manuscript uh, along with interpretation sometimes, or sometimes within the rewriting, we have this sort of uh, explanation pop up, or we might have a, a, a text, another text, just kind of slide right in there next to other biblical text that we know of. So it reflects some interpretation as well. Through the use of quotations of an authoritative text, a new book is made. It may have its own goals or its own aims. Uh, it has a new context in mind for its application. It has a new arrangement, a new overall structure. We might think about the Book of Jubilees for this. A uh, Book of Jubilees, a kind of a well-known pseudepigraphal, apocryphal book that existed before, or we knew of its existence before the Dead Series, but now we see it there as well. Now, for an example of rewritten scripture, and this is where it really begins to impact us and how we have probably often conceived of, uh, of these uh, biblical books being written, uh, we really need to look no further than the book of Chronicles. Chronicles. Uh, Chronicles, you see, basically copies uh, Samuels and Kings, the books of Samuels and the books of Kings. Uh, but he does this, of course, for his own reason. He does this uh, according to his own kind of outline, arrangement. I think I have a couple slides here uh, of a comparison of 2 Samuel 7, this famous promise to David, and 1 Chronicles 17. We might just uh, read it here. 2 Samuel 7 is on your left. Now, when the, king lived, uh, when the king lived in his house and all the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, 
Now we look over here to 1 Chronicles. This is 1 Chronicles on the right. Now when David lived in his house, back to verse 2 over here, the king said to Nathan the prophet, Look, I dwell in the house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. Look, I dwell in the house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Nathan said to the, David, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. And this just goes on and on and on for chapters and chapters and chapters. And guys, you can just scroll through. I knew I wouldn't have time for all of these, but this just goes on and on and on for chapters verbatim. This is what Chronicles does when he writes his book. And there's only minor differences. You see on that screen right there, there's a very minor change, but one that is very important because it affects the chronicler's understanding of the Messiah. So, uh, and of course, uh, Chronicles, you know, doesn't start with uh, in the same place as Samuel starts. No, Chronicles actually goes all the way back to Adam, right? And then, he, again, he ends in a slightly different place. So, again, Chronicles has his own agenda, but it really is just a rewriting of Samuel and Kings. And, and <laughs> there, there should go your, your kind of view of biblical authorship. Now, another type of textual growth, both in our Old Testament and witnessed at Qumran and other Second Temple literature, is a textual production that, again, grew out of an exegesis of the authoritative scriptural text. Again, I said this is sometimes called interbiblical exegesis. This is where the exegesis sought to explain uh, the text itself through a comment, a quotation, some kind of allusion. But then the exegetical comment or explanation actually became part of the scripture itself. And again, examples abound. We're going to look at a couple of these maybe later on. But we also see something like this in the books of the Bible. And that is where the uh, book of Jeremiah comes in. Now listen here just for a second. All right, put your, put your thinking caps on here just for a minute. We know that the first book of Jeremiah was burned, right, by the king. I mean, the book of Jeremiah tells us this, right? So Jeremiah, the first book is burned, right? And so then the Lord says, hey, make a second book and add a bunch of those words, then I'm going to give you some more words to add to it. And of course, Jeremiah is using his scribe Baruch to write all this down, right? He's his amanuensis. And we see here that Baruch wrote out a second book, which Baruch, quote, added many similar words to. This is what Jeremiah 36 itself tells us. Besides this, in the book of Jeremiah, we actually learn of four or five books that Jeremiah actually wrote. We could look at Jeremiah 25, 13, Jeremiah 32, 45, 1, 51, 60. There's another one in Jeremiah 29 that's a short book. Uh, we might call it a letter. But these are all kind of books that, again, the Bible itself tells us that Jeremiah wrote. Well, this obviously complicates our conception and understanding of how the biblical authors did their work. It's quite obvious, again, that, that uh, it doesn't follow kind of this simplistic model where Jeremiah was just writing down everything that was going on around him. Um, so at any rate, we see here an example of interbiblical exegesis at the end of Jeremiah 51. Everybody flip over to Jeremiah 51. And I want us to read, uh, we're going to read towards the end of the, end of the chapter. And the, the chapter is a prophecy against... Uh, Babylon, right? I mean, they, you know, we, we have some serious haters here in the book of Jeremiah, and Babylon, of course, gets the recipient, the brunt of uh, some of the, uh, the judgment. And uh, so at the end of the chapter, at the end of Jeremiah 51, after a prophecy against Babylon, we see the narrator tell us that Jeremiah wrote all these words in a book. This is probably verse 60 that I quoted a minute ago. After this, Jeremiah spoke to Sarai, the quartermaster, to Zedekiah, who was the king of Judah. And uh, he, so Jeremiah tells Sarai to take this book with him uh, to the king of Babylon when he's exiled there. All right, so there's some complication going on right there because there was a book and now there's more words and he's supposed to take that book. But at any rate, uh, we see at the end of Jeremiah 51:64, the very last clause of Jeremiah 51, 60, uh, 64, some very interesting words. It reads... Up to this point are the words of Jeremiah. Now, that's pretty interesting. I kind of like the NIV at this point. Uh, no laughter. Uh, I like the NIV here. It says, the words of Jeremiah end here. And we're like, wow, well, this is, this is pretty interesting, you know, because, of course, what do we have on the next page? 
I didn't catch that. More words. We have more words. Our book doesn't end at Jeremiah 51. There is another chapter. The words appear to be an authorial comment telling the reader that here is where Jeremiah's words end, but the author isn't finished, right? So notice somebody's telling us, oh, the Jeremiah's words end right here, but the author, Jeremiah, Baruch, whoever, you know, he's not finished. He's got more words. Now, that's interesting enough, but what's even more interesting is where Jeremiah 52 comes from. Jeremiah 52 is virtually verbatim from 2 Kings 24, verses 18 and following. So I've actually got that up on the screen as well, and I don't want to read long. We could read all the way to the end of the chapter, chapter 25, that is, but we'll just read here for a few moments. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamatal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. His mother's name was Hamatal. He did what was evil. He did what was evil. For because, for because, Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. And, you know, keep going, guys. One more. Uh, and in the ninth year of his reign, in the ninth year of his reign, you know, there was no food, there was no food. I mean, this just goes on. It's a verbatim use of 2 Kings 52. Again, so we can see the author at work. So we could ask the question, well, why is he doing us, uh, doing this? Jeremiah 52 and 2 Kings 24 is the story of Zedekiah's capture and demise. It's the story of Jerusalem's burning, the temple's destruction. And again, we see this verbatim use to either Kings itself or one of the sources, right? One of the annals that the uh, author of Kings had used. In other words, the author of Jeremiah comments on the prophecy against Babylon. Notice this. This is kind of this is a, a little, you know, switch in our thinking. The the author uses Jeremiah uh, uses Jeremiah 52. Well, let's just call it 2 Kings 24 to comment on the prophecy against Babylon by juxtaposing this text from 2 Kings to the prophecy against Babylon in the book of Jeremiah. Thus, we see this textual growth using a text that we already know is in the Bible or available to the biblical author from the annals of the kings of Judah. And now the new development is part of the biblical book of Jeremiah. So that is an example, a little example of interbiblical exegesis with one of our own inspired, inerrant texts. Well, at Qumran, scholars have seen related phenomena. Indeed, one such manuscript, what's called 4Q175, uh, or 4Q Testimonia, which survives only in one manuscript, lays four passages side by side without any clear comment on the purpose, all right? So here at Qumran, we have this manuscript, and all of a sudden, these four passages just boom, 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 right beside one another without any comment. What is going on? Well, this manuscript has caught the attention of scholars for decades because it's clear concern for messianism, right? Everybody's interested in the Messiah, especially in this period where we just discovered that happens to be very close to the time of our own Messiah, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The four passages are interesting. Exodus 20, Numbers 24, Deuteronomy 33 and Joshua 6. Well, why juxtapose these passages next to one another? How does the juxtaposition create sort of an implicit exegesis, a compositional technique and understanding? Well, scholars will continue to spill ink over the possibilities, I'm certain. Well, in conclusion then, we've just kind of handled Old Testament studies and in just a couple of analyses that begin to look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. These studies converge at similar conceptions of the making of these books. Authors produce these biblical books from authoritative and historical texts in order, in order to communicate particular content. Now, we haven't stated what the content in particular is, but that will allow us to segue very nicely into the second section of our lecture. Uh, that is Deuteronomy 33 in the composite shape of the Pentateuch.
So Deuteronomy 33. Let's move to Deuteronomy 33, our discussion of this. Deuteronomy 33 is a chapter-length poem that shares similarities with two other large poems in the Pentateuch. A lot of us know of this. We uh, used to have a professor here, John Salehammer. Uh, he stated that these poems, these three poems, make up a kind of poetic seams of the Pentateuch. He recognized early on uh, the diversity and complexity of some of these Old Testament texts. Of course, correctly approached them from a, this uh, perspective of inerrancy and inspiration and, uh, and saw this as this kind of structure through which uh, the author gave us his book. And he would have called his approach composition criticism. So he articulates this view of the Pentateuch in which the author had arranged three poems, Genesis 49, Numbers 24, and Deuteronomy 33. All of these poems have similar content, and they are important for the larger message of the Pentateuch. But there was never much of an explanation for the dissimilarities and the problems that we saw in Deuteronomy 33. As a matter of fact, really just like it has kind of defied explanation in the larger scholarship, it was just never really mentioned besides one or two of the similarities. So that's really what we're doing this morning is doing a little more digging on this. Well, each of these poems is introduced by a major character in the preceding narrative. The major character gives his audience a command to come or assemble before we read the phrase, in the last days. Now, uh, the phrase, in the last days, was very important to this uh, 4Q175. It was uh, in there several times as they looked for a Messiah in the last days. More on that in a moment. Uh, back to the scripture, Genesis 49.1 says, And Jacob called to his sons, and he said, quote, Assemble together so that I might declare to you what will happen to you in the last days. All right, now again, the, uh, in the last days turns out to be an important clue for us as readers. Numbers 24.14, we see the prophet Balaam say, Come, let me counsel you what this people will do to your people in the last days. Numbers 24 was another poem right there. So if the reader would continue to see this phrase in the last days, especially at similar kind of junctures of material, it could be, would be, should be significant. Well, this is what Salem pointed out. Uh, but we can also see that not only is the phrase important uh, because it's repeated and occurs at these kind of important junctures, uh, it's also important because it speaks of a future time period the last days, and it's also important because of a parallel word that is, uh, that is associated with this word uh, last in the last days, and that's the word reshit, which is actually the word beginning, right? And so again, I won't take time, but there's a discussion here about word pairs, akarit, and reshit often go together in biblical texts. As a matter of fact, the word reshit is in each of these biblical texts, Genesis 49, Numbers 24, and then we're going to look at the one in Deuteronomy 33, but we have to ask the question, what is going on in all of this? Well, graphically, then, it looks something like this, right? We have the two poems, Genesis 49.1, kind of pointing to Numbers 24.14, Numbers 24.14, pointing back. And now that I've laid some groundwork for the importance of the phrase, in the last days, and its relationship to reshit, which, of course, is the first word in the, in the Hebrew Bible, quote, in the beginning, that is, in the reshi, we should now consider uh, some of the other, or, or the other poem in Deuteronomy 33. We might have one more screen right there. So now we could even say, uh, we could partially say, or we could say tentatively that these two poems actually point all the way back to the very beginning of the Hebrew Bible, the first words of the Hebrew Bible in the beginning. Well, let's look a little bit at the third poem in Deuteronomy 33. We'll actually have to stop in 3129 because here is where we see another major character uh, after a long narrative, before an epilogue, have some important words for his audience. This is in Deuteronomy 3129. Moses actually has some pretty harsh words to say to his audience, but he picks it up. We pick it up there at 3129 because he says, for after for I know that after my death you will surely act corruptly. You will turn aside from the way that I have commanded you. Evil will befall you in the last days because you'll do what is evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger through the work of your hands. Very encouraging words, are they not? Uh, not really, right? So here's your leader. Here's the leader of Israel. Here's the leader of Israel, you know, telling, you know, look, I, I, there's no hope for you. 
I mean, you've been rebellious since I've been here. I mean, what's going to happen after I die? I mean, Moses knew. Moses knew. They were a stiff-necked people. See, several of you falling off out there. Hold on. Well, anyway, again, uh, here's another occasion which we observe uh, a narrative, a major character commanding an audience, using the phrase, in the last days, relating a major poem, and then an epilogue carries the text forward. So, again, graphically, it looks like this. I think we get the idea. We also see some recurring contents of the poem. I'm going to have them flash up there. There's a lot of things here in the last days, major character, lion imagery, ruler, scepter. Let's look at a couple of these. Genesis 49, we're going to go back to the poem in Genesis 49 here. Check out Genesis 49, 9. Judah is a cub of a lion. Next screen, guys. Judah is a cub of a lion from the prey. My son, you have gone up. He crouches down. He lies down like a lion, like a lioness who arouses him. Well, this is, you know, this is all very interesting. What, is it, what does it mean? What is it doing? Well, I don't know yet. Let's keep reading. Numbers 24, the same imagery. And again, this poem that's, again, juxtaposed or, or, or arranged here uh, in the book. Numbers 24, 9, he crouches down. He bends down like a lion, like a lioness who arouses him. Well, importantly, we also see kingly image here. Notice in Genesis 49, 10, Genesis 49, 10, a scepter will not depart from Judah and the one making rules from between his feet. This is why Genesis 49 is an important text at Qumran because they come back to this idea of scepter. Now, not only do we have the exact same words here, but we actually have a uh, use of poetry I'm looking at my English colleague. I'm sure he'll be very proud of me here. We have what's called metonymy, where scepter is used to actually note king or to uh, connote or denote king. And sure enough, this same usage shows up in Numbers 24. Not only does the scepter show up, but we also see in Genesis 49, we see this one who makes rules. So this is very interesting. Uh, uh, Jacob calls together his audience. He says, look, in the last days, there's going to be this king from Judah. The obedience of the peoples is actually going to be his. He's going to be a king. He's going to have a scepter. He's actually going to be, I don't know, one making rules. What what exactly does this mean? This uh, one making rules is actually from an uncommon verb in a rare stem, participial form, used three times in the Pentateuch. So the scepter uh, that we see in Numbers 27, this is in the vision of Balaam. Again, once again, in the last days, we see the kingly language where it becomes even more specific. It says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star comes from Jacob. They love this at Qumran. They love this at Qumran. And matter of fact, we've known, again, for millennia that Numbers 24 was a very messianic poem. Anyway, the star comes from Jacob. A scepter arises from Israel. He will smash the foreheads of Moab, tear down all the sons of Sheth. We actually see king and kingdom, more kingly words there in uh, that particular poem. Now, you know, all of this is, you know, kind of interesting. I think it's interesting. You may or may not. But can it really be that the Pentateuch is really interested in the last days? Uh, you, normally, I would ask my class here. I'll see if I get any responses. What do we, what is it, what do we call the study of the last things? eschatology can it really be that the pentateuch is about eschatology no way no way well how does all this relate to the dead sea scrolls did they utilize any of these texts in their exegesis again qumran think 250 200 150 150 bc of course a lot of these traditions had been handed down for centuries well let's turn to that issue now Qumran, Dead Sea Scrolls. By the way, Qumran was the environment where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, so I'm using those almost synonymously here. Again, there are three pieces of literature. I think I have a screen here. Yes, Uh, three pieces of literature, all of which are only witnessed on single manuscripts, Uh, but there's three of them here that bear relevance for our discussion today, 4Q174, 4Q175, and uh, 4Q252. just means the fourth cave of Qumran, and then they have them numbered. They also have names here, which I'll come to momentarily. Uh, Two of these texts, uh, Florilegium and Testimonia, are called exegetical texts. Exegetical texts because they contain a biblical passage 
with some explanation. So they're very similar to what we were talking about earlier with Jeremiah. They contain biblical texts juxtaposed to one another, sometimes without explanation, like what we saw above in 4Q175. But the reason why I bring these three in particular to bear today is because they quote the three passages that we use today. All right, they quote Numbers 24, Genesis 49, and Deuteronomy 33. Now, let me say from the outset that scholars agree, everybody agrees, and you, I don't use that terminology lightly. Some people say that all the time and don't really mean it, but I'm meaning it. Uh, Qumran was not a Christian sect, right? They did not view Jesus as the Messiah. They didn't mention the name of Jesus, although, again, you know, the, some of the texts could have come from the period right around Jesus. Uh, neither is their view of Messiah what Jesus would come or what the Christian community, what we would say, right? So, it's, again, it's just important to bear that in mind. So what I'm using these texts for is to help us to understand that there was a messianic expectation, there was an eschatological expectation sometime in the centuries leading up to Christ. So although these uh, messianic interpretations were not what we find in the New Testament, this literature is full of messianic and eschatological expectations. Some of the, some of the really fun secondary research has been done in this area. Well, as a matter of fact, like I said, the very phrase that tipped, off, tipped us off as readers that Moses is doing something intentional regarding the lion from the tribe of Judah that's going to come in the last days, that phrase, in the last days, was, of course, important for several compositions at Qumran, even the sectarian documents, right, the documents that were some of their own and, told, uh, and spoke of their own beliefs and viewpoints and rules, like the Damascus document, the rule of congregation, used this phrase, in the last days. As a matter of fact, the phrase, in the last days, occurs an amazing uh, over 30 times in this literature. In 4Q174, one of the texts here, the Flora Legium, actually occurs as a framing device. So they have these four texts, and at the beginning or end of each of these, it actually says, in the last days, and it quotes the text. So it's a real framing device. For that text, scholars have actually proposed these titles. Listen to the titles for 4Q174. A Midrash on the Last Days. A Midrash on 2 Samuel 7 and Psalm 1 and 2. Again, those two, uh, you, you probably, there are not two more messianic uh, passages probably in the entire Bible, unless it's Numbers 24. Uh, a messianic florilegium. Right, these are the titles uh, proposed for, again, 4Q174. The titles alone are enough to indicate the prominence of both the phrase in the last days and this issue of Messiah. Uh, one of the other ones quotes these passages. This is uh, 4Q175, I think, if I remember correctly. 2 Samuel 7. Psalm 1 and 2, Exodus 15, Amos 9 11, Numbers 24, Genesis 49, Deuteronomy 33. I mean, again, this is like a messianic, you know, parade of texts that come before these. So, again, my point isn't that these texts yield a similar message, but they do show us that they were used for messianic and eschatological purposes and even structurally important. Well, now let's get back to Deuteronomy 33. Again, we're going we're gonna to kind of quickly go through some of this. Um, we're going to focus on 33.7. This is the uh, announcement, pronouncement regarding Judah, and then we're going to go to 20 through 22. The chapter breaks down actually into three parts. Um, the uh, little introduction that is about Yahweh or God or maybe Moses. It's again, it's a bit of a question here in uh, verses 2 through 5. Then we have Moses blessing the tribes of Israel in 6 through 25. Then finally, we have a conclusion that returns to the subject of God at the end in 26 through 29. So let's consider verse 7 because this is uh, supposed, this is about Judah, right? So, and this for Judah. And he said, Hear, O Lord, the voice of Judah. May you cause him to come to his people. He strove with his hands, and may you be a help against his adversaries. Well, if we're comparing this blessing of Judah with the one in Genesis 49 and Numbers 24, it looks pretty muted to me. Of course, we have a supplication that Yahweh caused Judah to come, right, as if there was a Judah yet to come. We see Judah fighting with the enemies. Again, another thing that Judah, the, the son of Judah, is going to do in Genesis 49. We're dealing with a third masculine singular figure, so we have these things. 
But where is the scepter? Where's the ruler? Where, where's the lion king? Well, I'm glad you asked. You know, he's, he's coming. He's coming, and we're going to engage those images in Deuteronomy 33, 20 and 22. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to read Deuteronomy 33, 20, and then I'm going to read 22, and then we'll come back and do 21 momentarily. Deuteronomy 33, 20 says, And to Gad he said, Blessed is he who enlarges Gad. Like a lion, he crouches, he tears the arm, indeed the head. And to Dan, he said, Dan is a whelp, a lion. He leaps from Bashan. Well, here we go, right? We have it. The lion imagery obviously jumps out at you. It's the exact same lexemes. Again, poetic imagery that's pretty rare in the Pentateuch and in the Hebrew Bible in general, except for, again, these kind of poetic images. You cannot miss it. It's the same word. Same image-driven pictures that feature a lion or lioness getting ready to pounce on her prey. Of course, the only problem is it's not about Judah nor Jacob. It seems to be regarding the tribes of Gad and Dan, two tribes that, you know, are not really the focus point, right, of, of uh, anything. Well, if you remember in the opening, the classic article, as well as those who follow them, don't even think 21 should be here, right? If you can recall all the way back to the opening, they didn't think 21 should be here. They think it needs to be rearranged to above, somewhere up in the introduction where it's talking about Moses or even talking about Yahweh. Now, there's grammatical reasons for that that I'm not going to get into, but first of all, the blessing actually speaks of Yahweh. It, the blessing is not to Gad at all. And remember, we're in this section where Moses is blessing the tribes, but the, the, the uh, blessing shifts away from Gad. Friedman, actually quoting earlier, says related to verse 20, and the verse is related to Gad, that the Masoretic text, again, just the Hebrew Bible, is suspicious as the only instance in, the, uh, in which the blessing is applied to Yahweh instead of the tribe. And he goes on to talk about the second colon of verse 20. He says, look, there's no connection between the first colon and those which follow, however the words are interpreted. So what do we do with this? Well, let's, again, look closely at Deuteronomy 33, 21. Now, the English versions go different directions in the verse. So I'm going to transliterate the difficult word in the first clause and then follow the New American Standard for the rest of the verse. So here's Deuteronomy 33, 21. Then he provided the reshit. Remember, that's the Hebrew word for beginning or first or head. Then he provided the reshit for himself. For there, the ruler's portion was reserved. He came with the leaders of the people. He executed the justice of the Lord. His ordinances are with Israel. So let me state my proposal here straightforwardly, all right? So if, you've, if I've happened to have lost you, now's a great time for you to, to return to uh, Binkley Chapel. So here it is. The author has intentionally positioned the clauses that make up verse 21 because he wants to explain who or what the lion imagery is in verses 33 and 20. See, he's explaining here. And he uses verse 21 to explain what's going on in 20 and 22. As a matter of fact, he's going to use information from Genesis 49 and Numbers 24, among other passages, to actually exegete the lion imagery in verses 20 and 22. Now, again, there's some great questions. I wish we had time to dialogue over here. One would be, well, you know, why does the lion imagery concern Gad and Dan rather than Judah? Why didn't you just write the, the poem the way you wanted it in the first place? Well, that's a great question, and one that should drive you to think about your view of biblical authorship that is requiring that. So there's part of me that wishes he did that too, but I think we can actually see a few things here from this. First of all, we can see from the fact that it doesn't smoothly flow regarding a Judah reading, we could say, this shows that we're dealing here with an ancient poem that was already in existence before Moses or before the author used it. Otherwise, it just would have been nice and smooth. We actually see that, oh, wow, this is actually a historical poem that the author is dealing with. Second, second it shows a, it shows a, a more uh, definite or particular or determined intention of the author that he wants us to know something specifically regarding this lion that was important enough for him to go out of his way to juxtapose verse 21 and to write comments on it that, again, naturally probably 
did not fit or flow there. Whatever it is that these clauses convey, their content is of the utmost importance to the author. Perhaps they should be important to us as well. Now, one other thing it shows that we've already talked about, it shows the way that these biblical texts were authored. And again, again, in other words, the author has intentionally sandwiched the, uh, the lion imagery around this word reishi. I think I have a slide there for that. So there it is. We got two lions. We got the reishi, the ruler, the Moses-like leader. Again, just to state it straightforwardly on the PowerPoint, the author has repositioned or written the clauses constituting verse 21 so that we read the clauses of verse 21 and associate them with the lion imagery otherwise known in Genesis 49 and Numbers 24. He's exegeting. He is drawing out the meaning of the lion imagery in 20 and 22 in order to explain the lion imagery, provide a framework for the whole of the Pentateuch. So very, very quickly, the clause, and he provided the ray sheet for himself. This clause utilizes a verb of the form, uh, I'm sorry, a form of the verb to see, and the Lamed preposition plus pronoun as a means to indicate he saw for himself. Again, I think most of the time it's uh, said, it's uh, translated provided. This combination occurs three times in the Hebrew Bible, three passages in the entire Hebrew Bible. It occurs here. It occurs in the well-known passage in Genesis 22:8, when Abraham is to sacrifice his son Isaac, and, and Abraham says to Isaac, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. The third place isn't as well known. 1 Samuel 16, where God tells Sam, uh, Samuel, hey, stop grieving over Saul. I've rejected him because, quote, Yahweh had seen for himself a king from the tribe of Jesse. So why is Moses blessing Yahweh? Because he will provide for himself a reshit. That is, reshit is cast in the same terminology as the lamb that will be sacrificed. It's cast in the same terminology as a king from the tribe of Jesse. We are proposing that reshit be understood as the very lion from the tribe of Judah, the star from Jacob. This would explain the use of it in each of the three contexts where we find the last days. Moreover, it also connects the author's use with it here all the way back to the first word of the Hebrew Bible, Genesis 1.1. In the reshit, God created the heavens and the earth. Hmm, very interesting. In a sense, we could say that God provided the first lion for himself or the lion king first for himself. In other words, the author is writing from the vantage point of the end of the Pentateuch, and he's explaining that Yahweh provided the beginning one as the Lion King. He wants you, to, he wants you the reader, to associate the Lion King with other occurrences of the phrase. Well, let's move quickly. The second clause is equally difficult. It reads, because there, I think I have a slide here, because there the inheritance of the paneled ruler That was intentional. That, 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 that pause was intentional. What is a paneled ruler? Well, one scholar actually literally asked, what would this mean? Well, the English, uh, New American Standard, says the ruler's portion was revert, uh, reserved. The NIV says the leader's portion was kept for him. The JPS, they're the portion of the revered chieftain. The difficulty lies in two places. First, what does it mean that we see the ruler's portion? Well, you might be guessing that this is the very exact rare participle that was used in Genesis 49 to describe the son of Judah. That is the one making rules in Genesis 49.10. Who is this king from the tribe of Judah? He is the one who will make the rules. It's no wonder that commentators think it's Moses from verses 2 and 5 because, again, Moses obviously was Israel's rule maker. But here it's applied to this king from the tribe of Judah who would come in the last days. He is the one who makes the rules. Moreover, it's fitting, given Moses' statement in Deuteronomy 18, that a prophet like Moses would arise. Well, the second uh, quick conundrum here in this verse is this word that I translated as reserved. Listen to what scholar Gary Rensberg says in an abstract to his uh, article on this word. He says, new, new slide guys, the meaning of the word safun in Deuteronomy 33:21 has defied scholars for millennia. 
That's two of them. The ancient versions and rabbinic interpretations, which typically point to an understanding hidden, buried, and I love this statement, reflect more eisegesis than any real uh, awareness of the word's actual meaning. Rensburg goes on to suggest that the reading of the Greek translation of the Old Testament is impossible because such a form occurs nowhere, uh, nowhere outside or inside the Hebrew Bible. Besides that, our oldest manuscript actually reflects the MT. Now, wouldn't you guess that the word translated as hidden is used six other times in the Hebrew Bible? Six times this word safan is used. Each of the other occasions refers to the temple house or Solomon's house that is paneled with rare wood in 1 Kings 6 and then also once in Haggai. So the word is translated a covering, wall, uh, covering a wall with paneling. What does it mean? Is it possible that the lemma is another connection to the notion of a king? In other words, the one making laws is literally portrayed in temple, palace and temple-like language. He is covered, so to speak, with honored materials or is likened into the temple and palace of a king. We could spend more time here in a similar conversation going on in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, the last three clauses we're going to deal with very quickly. Uh, we could conclude with other scholars that it does appear that the next clause was taken from a description of Yahweh and Moses in verse 2 and 5 and put here. Like Yahweh and like Moses did in verse 2, the Lion King was part of the procession out of Egypt with the heads of the peoples, and now he is described as one who would come in the last days with the heads of the peoples. Here then, the Lion King will again take on the royal character of the Davidic branch of Yahweh himself. He will do, this Lion King will do righteousness, and his judgments are with Israel. Similar verse found in Jeremiah 33. Well, in conclusion, let's think about this just very briefly. First, we could consider again uh, hermeneutics. How do these things help us understand the Hebrew Bible? Here we see the author at work. We see him at work, and what, are his, what, what is he interested in? He's interested in two things. He's interested in this period he calls the last days, and he's interested in this messianic king. I mean, to me, this is, this is mind-blowing. This is mind-blowing that the author of the Pentateuch, at the end of the Pentateuch, is really, we can see him shift things. We can see his handiwork, and he's interested in eschatology or the last days, and he's interested in the Messiah. We could talk about promise and fulfillment here if we wanted to as well. I'm going to skip a little bit here so that we can get down to content. What is the meaning of the content can we say that the first word in the Hebrew Bible is actually associated with the last days? Can we even associate this with the very lion king from the tribe of Judah? So that when we read the first word in the Hebrew Bible, we, we, the author actually wants you to think the reshi, the lion king from the tribe of Judah? Crazy. Crazy. And I'm sure some of you are thinking, yep, crazy, all right. Well, Let's just cut to the chase. Who else might have thought this way? How about John 1, 1 through 3? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that has been made. How is John getting the fact that Jesus is actually creator? Maybe he's been reading the Pentateuch. What about Colossians 1? This is even more straightforward. Colossians 1, look at this. He is the image, Genesis 1 word, of the invisible God, Genesis 1 concept. The firstborn, Genesis 1. Creation, Genesis 1. By him all things were created, Genesis 1. Heaven and earth, Genesis 1. Visible and invisible. Thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created, for, uh, Genesis 1 word, through him and for him. He is before, Genesis 1, and in him all things hold together. He is the head, Genesis 1, of the body, the church. He is the beginning, Genesis 1, the firstborn, Genesis 1, from the dead, that in everything he might be first place, Genesis 1. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, through him to reconcile all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace through the blood of his cross. As one scholar actually puts this, Otto Prox, last slide, already in Genesis 1-1, the concept of the last days fills the mind of the reader. He 
Here then, the Pentateuch, the very first unit of text in the Hebrew Bible, is actually asserting with its first word something about the end. And it's associated with the Lion King from the tribe of Judah. He's coming in judgment. He's coming to command obedience. Is this your Jesus? With John, we could read. Why don't we all read this together? I think it's on the slide, guys, please. Let's just conclude with this. Can you guys see that? Read if you can. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God set out into all the earth. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we are indeed grateful, Lord, for this Lamb that was slain for us. So grateful for the blood that covered our sins and transgressions against you, eternal Father. We're so grateful. We're grateful, Father, that he came. We're grateful that the power displayed in the resurrection raised him from the dead and that he was ascended and then, uh, then you sent his spirit, Lord, which in these last days has raised us up to new life to worship the king the lion, this lamb. Lord, we pray that you would indeed use these texts, your word, to embolden us and enliven us to carry out your purposes in these last days. We pray in Christ's name, amen.